Okay, so all of the clinical trials that are done at Delcat Del fall under my purview. That is not, um, we're small, we're a virtual company. Uh, we're about 12 people in the New York office. So, uh, you know, we, we do everything um, with the help of our partners. And in fact, uh, one of our partners is Melody. And um, the gentleman here in the slide is actually uh, the Vice President of Operations at Novella, which is a company in North Carolina that helps us do the trial. So they monitored the trial globally and uh, they actually donated uh, to the foundation to be able to, uh, to do the run in North Carolina. So, um, you know, it's all about the friends on our journey and I'm going to talk about our journey with this device in a short little while. So, does anybody, before I, I kind of start, does anybody know what Delcap Systems, that's the name of our company, but when, um, does anybody know anything about our device? One person, okay, so I know kind of what to cover. Great, okay. So what I'm going to talk about, as you heard today from several of the folks that came up about phase ones, about phase twos, about phase threes, and Dr. Patel and Dr. Or, or Blue did a really good job in describing what the phase one, and the phase twos, and the phase threes are. So um, we've actually gotten much better in the industry of accelerating the development of drugs in general. I've been working on um, cancer drugs for the last 30 years, and when I started, it used to take about 17, 20, 17 years from when um, something was discovered, like in Stefan's lab and then it got actually to the patients on the market. Um, now, um, on average, it takes about 10 years. But our journey has been a little different, so I will walk you through that. So our mission at Delcap is really to make a meaningful difference to patients who, are, who have cancers of the liver in particular. So we're very specific in what we treat. We treat liver cancer um, and, all the, and the cancers that metastasize to the liver. And we're very interested, our prime focus is to get, you must have heard of a label, right? So we are, uh, our application at the agencies, whether it's in Europe or in the US, is to get the approval to be able to treat ocular melanoma with liver metastases. So that's what's gonna be on our label. So we can't treat ocular melanoma without liver metastases, we can't treat other cancers with liver metastases. Our label is going to be very specific. So it's like when you take, you know, a bottle of Tylenol, it says, you know, you won't be able to use it for necessarily gastric uh, inflammation. You have to use it for headache or pain and so forth. Okay, so our journey. So um, interestingly enough, I made this very small because our journey has been quite complex. And it, 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 I didn't want necessarily for you to spend all your time with the, uh, the actual wording of it. I'll walk you through it. So our journey did start in 2001, believe it or not. Um, it was two guys at Yale that came up with this device. And as Dr. Sato um, kindly set us up, you know, the, the, really, the deadly disease is in the liver for people who have liver metastases. And you saw on his graph, you know, 80% of this disease actually metastasizes to the liver. And um, the, the founders who created this device actually believed that if you could treat the liver without affecting the rest of the systemic body, then um, you actually had a better chance of survival for the patients. So in 2001, it took us 11 years to do a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three. It was our first generation device. And um, we took it to the FDA, and the FDA uh, turned it down. It took us three years to make a second device. So to improve the parts of our current device, to actually be able to, and I'll show you how it works, but to be able to get the chemotherapy concentrated in the liver without having it go elsewhere in your body. It took us another three years, so in 2000. And 16, we actually got approval for a second trial, phase three, with the second device. So this is the first phase three with the second device. 
And this device is an improvement, and it gives, um, we believe it'll, it'll make the patients feel much better and will give better results. So now we're in this trial since 2016, and um, the FDA, because of our first attempt, was um, adamant that we use comparators. And just like you know, you've seen some of the presenters talk about, our comparators were immunotherapy. And um, we actually had a lot of conversations with the FDA about that because a lot of people weren't coming on the trial because of the, tr of the actual comparator arm. And so I'll go into all of that. Am I talk? are you guys, you guys, you guys are such a good group. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm talking to a, a bunch of very experienced uh, people in this disease. Yes. Can I just ask you one quick question? Yes. So, I get it, metastasis of the liver with Dr. Melanoma is your focus. But yes. in 2001, was it treatment of metastasis of the liver with ocular melanoma when they started this, or was it treating? I, I thought you kind of segued over to just emphasis on delivery of the drug to the liver without wiping out other parts of the body. Yeah, so um, most phase ones in oncology, um, when we start phase one, like was explained, we're looking for a dose and we're looking for safety. And we don't actually always know at that point what is going to be our best target. Is it going to be breast cancer with metastases, um, gastric cancer with liver metastases, ocular melanoma? So the phase one and the phase two actually were, were we're looking at multiple diseases. And then um, the it was narrowed liver. down because treating of- Treating the liver. Yeah, treating the liver. And it was narrowed down to ocular melanoma for the phase three because that's where the, the highest success rate was. And we felt that that was the best um, place where we can make an impact immediately. Thanks. Yeah, and of course. I like questions. So, um, I am a poor substitute for this gentleman here who's our global um, PI. He's at the Moffitt Cancer Center. This is Dr. Jonathan Zager. He has actually been on working with us since the first generation device on the phase three. So he's been working with us for a very, very long time. And um, he has done the compassionate use um, that some of you guys might have heard about Sabrina. Um, yeah, so she was one of Dr. Zager's patients and um, so Dr. Zager is our global PI for this study. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how this works. And um, I'm gonna step aside so everybody can, can get this clearly. So it's really a, if you think about it, a three-step process for this. So this is a invasive surgery. You are under complete anesthesia for this and um, it's percutaneous hepatic perfusion, and it's actually done in three steps. So the basis of the, of the actual surgery is three steps. We isolate the liver from the rest of the circulation of the body, and it's done with balloons placed at the top and at the bottom of the liver so that the circulation of the liver is limited within the liver. We saturate then the liver with high dose chemotherapy, and then we filter that chemotherapy out through our filtration system, and the filtrated blood goes back into your body. And the whole procedure um, takes normally up to four hours. I think, um, Dr. Sato, your team can do it in about three, two and a half, three hours. They're very good at it. They've done many, many cases. Um, so that is the general principle, the three steps of how this device works. Any, is that? Is it easy? done with a uh, temporary bypass? Yes, it's done with a vena vena bypass, exactly. So there is a line that your blood is, the blood is circulating outside of the body. Is it cleaned outside the body or just circulated? It's cleaned through the filters outside of the body. And I will show you. So let me then walk you through. 
The, um, you'll see that the study is done at very specialized sites because you actually need seven people, at least, minimum, to, to carry out this procedure. And that is because you have um, an interventional radiologist that's working the catheters, you have the surgical oncologist, you have a perfusionist who's actually perfusing the chemotherapy into your liver, and you have various, the anesthesiologist who's key because as we're isolating the liver out of, away from the rest of your body, you know, we're, we're disturbing your, circular, your circulatory system, so your blood pressure kind of goes up and down as we're doing this procedure. So the anesthesiologist is key in stabilizing you at all times. And we have various nurses and you know, people in there that are helping out. So it, it is um, quite logistically involved, but the sites that do it are very good at it. So this is how it works. So if you can imagine, um, there's, we try, we don't, you have just two little incisions, one on each side of, of your leg, and one of them is to, the one where the green is, is actually um, to inject the, to actually um, put the catheter through up to the liver, and then you have, this is our proprietary catheter, which isolates the liver and then has a, and allows the chemotherapy to get injected in. So we actually inject the liver with chemotherapy, try to get all the tumors, and then filtrate the blood out. Chemotherapy goes away and back into your body. So that is that a good pictorial for you? <laughs> it's a little simplistic, but... Um, dialysis, basically. Yeah. To, to go back, it is a, a, a sort of dialysis. They're carbon-based um, filters with a, a special um, poly, poly coating on it that captures the melphalan, which is the chemotherapy drug that we're using. Melphalan. It's a very, um, very old drug. It was... Uh, I believe marketed in the 60s. Um, highly toxic chemotherapy drug. Uh, it's not used as much just because there's been better chemotherapies that have come out, and especially with the targeted agents um, that target just the cancer. Uh, this one is more of a systemic one, but for this particular application, it's actually friendly to the hepatic cells, so they call it hepato-friendly, so it doesn't kill off the rest of your liver cells as this is given. It kills off specifically your, the, um, the tumor cells and what they call miliary disease, which is all those little micro-metastases that are in the liver that we can't really see necessarily on CT scans or MRIs. Okay, so, when we went back to the FDA, a um, lot of negotiations, and we came back with a global multi-center multi randomized phase three trial. So this was back in 2016 for patients with hepatic dominant, dominant ocular melanoma. That meant we had a one-to-one -one randomization. That means that you had a 50% chance of getting our, our surgery, or a 50% chance of getting standard of care. And the standard of care was the immunotherapy agents, the single agents that Dr. Sato referred to, or we were, uh, the sites were allowed to do what they call chemoembolization, which is a, another um, liver-directed therapy. Then we looked at our primary endpoint was overall survival. That means we followed people to see how long they survived um, on this therapy. Now our therapy is um, unlike other cancer treatments where you actually treat until toxicity or progression, we actually have a finite number of treatments that we can do. So we actually only do this six times. So you can get the procedure six times, it's every six weeks. So if you think about it, the patient gets the surgeries on a six week basis for about a year. And then after that, 
um, the, there's no more treatments because that is what we believe will um, we were allowed and what we uh, believe would cure or not cure but um, stabilize the disease at least. Secondary endpoints, we were looking at um, the growth of your tumor. So progression-free survival is how long has your tumor not grown, as well as objective response rates. And then we were looking at, of course, the most important thing is when you have a therapy, is are you trading, what's your trade-off of benefit risk? So do you feel better or do you have more adverse events and feel worse than when you started? Right? So that's what the FDA usually looks, like, looks at. They say, is, the, is your treatment helping the patients? Are the tumors shrinking? But are they so sick because of the adverse events that it's really not worth it? So safety is always our primary concern. And we look at quality of life as well because we want to know from your point of view. I mean, the doctors are evaluating your blood tests. Your, your angiogram, you know, your, your CT scans and everything. But from your point of view, are you able to do all your daily activities? And that's very important to know as well. Um, and then PK, pharmacokinetics, is we want to measure how long, if there's any blood, if there's any, if there's any drug in your blood after the filters, and how much of it is there. So we measure that. So what we did, this was a bit of a difficult trial because nobody wanted to go on this BAC arm, which is best alternative care. Um, but some of the sites were not, some of the investigators weren't happy to propose this to the patients, they, um, but they knew that therapy had a place in all the therapies that you guys could have access to. Um, so we started talking to the FDA and by, um, we got the help of Dr. Sato's team, we got the help of Dr. Patel as well to, uh, to go to the FDA. And by June of this year, we were able to write a new protocol. And this is what I came here to discuss with you guys. So what we did is the protocol took out the randomization, which, as Dr. Sato alluded to, most of the phase threes, you have to compare it to something because it's like, is, you know, if you think about it, you know, we're, we're, we're asking is, is game brand, detergent brand, better than Tide detergent brand? If you don't have another comparator, it's like you won't know how good game is, right? So um, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a gamble for us. So we got rid of the randomization, we got rid of this arm. So the patients, when you come on the trial, you go straight into our arm of the of the treatment, and that meant our endpoints were changing. We can no longer look at overall survival because overall survival, again, is a comparison. So what we can look at now is only do your tumors grow or not, and how long are you cancer free? So if your tumor has shrunk, how long does that last? So that's what we're, we're looking at now. Any questions? I know this is kind of like protocol design, hypothesis, researchy stuff, but you guys are all so smart. I'm, I'm so impressed with this, this group. No questions? No? Okay. Great. So, this is very busy, but it's a slide that actually tells you exactly what changed. So we went from a comparator study to a single arm study. We went from changing our endpoint from overall survival to looking at the tumor growth. We look, we're now gonna look at the duration of the response, so how long is your good response? So if you get a partial response or a complete response, how long is that lasting? Um, disease control as well. So you can imagine that if we're looking at how long this goes on for, we're gonna follow you and you're gonna get calls from your site and your doctor for quite a long time because we wanna see how you're doing and that's very important information to us. Um, we have um, added some adverse events that are of particular interest to us and just cleaned up the protocol. So, the rationale. So why did we, why did we do this for 18 months? Why did we labor for 18 months to talk to the, the FDA? 
It's because as soon as December 2016, and I wasn't at the company yet, but Tom, my colleague, can attest to it, we started getting calls from patients that said, and calls from sites saying, we can't random, we can't put people on this study. People are not interested in going on to a treatment right now in certain sites that they know doesn't work. They had called the FDA, so that actually opened the door for us to talk with the FDA. Mm -hmm. And we started talking with them. We had a few failed attempts in those 18 months, but um, we actually pulled through this protocol. And as you had seen um, in the slides this morning, several of the presenters also talked about how rare this disease is. So if we had to enroll 250 patients worldwide um, in a short time frame, I mean, that's 10% that's of the world population that we needed. So doing this design actually enabled us to enroll less patients. So it changed the number of patients we need to actually prove our hypothesis. And um, we were able to, again, show that the immunotherapies um, were, as single agents, were not effective in this disease. So we were comparing ourselves to something that already is known to be very low effic efficiency for the patient. So why are we putting, ethically, why should we put patients on this, on this therapy? So we were able to make all those arguments. And um, ex it got accepted. So uh, we're, we're very happy. We started enrolling. We got our first patients on this new protocol in August. So it's not, not a new study because all the patients that have come on since 2016 are still in the study. We're still following them up. They're going to finish their treatments, but um, now we can enroll patients in this new design. So here are some of the protocol changes. It's gone to a single arm. It's, uh, we're still in the same sites. We have 33 sites globally, and I will show you later who those are. And um, we still have three phases. So the important thing for us was that we could, all the patients that had contributed to the trial to date, not be excluded from the analysis. So when you do a study, you want to have a similar patient population so you can statistically compare all the data you get. So we didn't change any of the inclusion exclusion criteria to make sure that anybody who's contributed to our research to date we can use their data because we know how much of a stretch it is for people to, to to participate in research. So it was really important for us that every data, every blood sample we've collected, we can use. So we have a screening phase where you screen, you see if you're eligible for the study, you go through all the tests. And then we have the treatment phase, which is six treat up to six treatments of up to six surgeries and um, for about a year, and then you have a follow-up phase that is indefinite. So. so really, for the studies, what's the effect on the patients? So our study's ongoing, right? It's been ongoing since 2016. So everybody's question was, well, what happens to, how does that change for the patients? Well, really, we're doing the same controls, we're looking at the same safety and even more the only thing that changes is you're not able to get randomized to the BAC arm. And that is really any, the only thing that changes. We didn't change the schedule of events, of when the visits are, or when you have to come to the hospital, or what type of inclusion exclusion. So it's really, we've removed one of the arms of the study. So this slide is really to tell you that you know, everybody's going to sign a consent, and everybody who signed a consent will get considered for the trial. So people who were on cycle two when this protocol came out, right? So they were on a second surgery, and um, this protocol came out. What happens to them? Well, they're just going to continue. They're going to go all the way up to where they can. If they can get to cycle six, they will. For those who were on, who were randomized to the best alternative care, what happens to them? Does that mean they're automatically off the study? No. They're going to finish their treatment as prescribed, and then we're going to follow them up 
until the end, until, they, they, until we can no longer follow them up. So we want to, again, it's very important for us to capture all the safety and all the data from everybody who's contributed to this because it's invaluable to us and um, it's very important. So everybody's going to be followed up. Now the patient who, the newly diagnosed patient, the patient that was diagnosed last week, if they come and their physician decides they are right for this trial, and it's a discussion between you and your physician, then they sign a new consent, they automatically get, don't get randomized, they automatically see if they're eligible for the surgeries and go on to the, um, the PHPs. Any questions? Yes. No. Are you going to be going over what the eligibility requirements are? <clears throat> I will not. And the reason is because it's we have um, about 15 inclusion criteria and about 24 exclusion criteria. And every, it's very different for every patient. Um, mostly what we're looking for is patients who are who don't have, we, we test for like heart disease, we test for other cancers, we test for significant concomitant medications, we test for other medications. So it's, it's quite a long list and it's really, again, it depends on what you were treated with, what your actual status is right now, and it's very individualized. So, I mean, they are on clinicaltrial.gov. We put them up on clinicaltrial.gov, so you can definitely go see them on clinicaltrial.gov. But it was a, a bit of a conscious decision that we made not to go over it because um, I wouldn't be able to tell you if you're eligible because I, I haven't done the blood tests on you. I haven't seen your CT scan. I haven't, you know, um, being able to, to look at your EKG or your echo or things like that. So, how long is this um, this phase of the trial going to be open for? So we are hoping to get all the patients we need enrolled. My my job is writing on it by <laughs> by next June. So. Um, we are hoping that by next June we'll be able to have all the patients we need. And how many more do you need? Um, we, we um, just to cut you off, everyone, we, um, you know, the, the company believes that with this amendment that we made to the trial, that we can complete the enrollment phase of the trial by the middle of 2019 and next year. So that's, that's what the goal that we set ourselves for. Following that, that's the enrollment phase. So that means all the patients that we need to collect the data um, are on the trial and we'll continue to track and analyze that data. So what happens after that is that the, the company will begin to prepare and collate that data, do an analysis on it, and prepare a submission to the FDA. That can take less, an additional months, and we wouldn't know how long until that process is run. And so this is the third phase? Excuse me? This, this, is, this is, the, is a phase three This trial. is a phase three. So it's our second phase three, which is very unusual, because we changed, we, mo we, um, we modified and improved our device. So if this is a, this is a trial. Yes. What's being used in Europe? Why is that a trial here? It's a very good question. Um, so in Europe, it was approved as a device, and um, that was what the FDA turned down. So now we're it's being submitted as a drug device combination, and we will submit it again in Europe as a drug device combination. So in Europe, we don't actually provide the melphalan with the kit for commercial cases. Just to add to Natalie's answer there, um, the, you know, Natalie made reference to a labeled indication, which is important for everybody here because you want to have a therapy that's approved for human use. It helps for, um, you know, for reimbursement and all those things later down the road. Um, in Europe, we have we're approved as a device, but it's not specific to any disease. So it's a kind of lengthy conversation between doctor and patient as to what they're, whether or not this therapy can benefit each individual patient. It would be better for everyone if this had clear label for oculomol and liver metastasis. So that is what we're working on. So in Europe, the, the therapy is available, and it's, it's available as and regulated as a device. But this, the FDA views this as a drug because it is primarily a drug therapy, and that's.
that's the, that's the, that's the threshold and the, the evidentiary standard that we were trying to get. So would insurance cover this? No. Um, not, yeah, I mean, it's for Well, I mean, States. once it gets approved in the U.S., that is then it goes to um, a, an, a like, committee, and the committee decides whether it's going to be reimbursed or not. Um, in Europe, it's going through the same thing because it doesn't have a label because it's a device. It is not reimbursed for patients. So the, the sites that do it for European patients actually have grants that support the reimbursement. There is insurance reimbursement in certain markets in Europe. Yeah. In Germany, for example, they, they have a, a, a standard where this has been adopted as part of their for treatment protocols for certain diseases. So reimbursement is under the, uh, available in those conditions. Um, right. But you know, there are other funding mechanisms available, and that's how it Yeah, they do have, um, I mean, they're reimbursed, but they do have, I guess, uh, caveats. So it's not as simple as, 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 it, as it looks. Do you have the animal sick straightens, or does it work after three, or can you do three and if you're the tumor? So for the study, for the study, it is six. Uh, if you can tolerate the six, we're looking at six. Um, once we get approval, if we get approval, then um, it might be that you do two, there's a break, two more, that will be up to the sites to decide, but they will have much more flexibility. But we've kind of been boxed in by the regulators to be very, very specific. So um, it's six every six weeks. In the commercial side, for those patients in Europe, um, it's, it's different. So we see that they might have two treatments, have like a period, a rest period, and then two more treatments, um, or not. Maybe after two treatments, they're fine. So it's really very individualized. What are the side effects? Um, the side effects, so as you can imagine, it's a filter. And your, your red blood cells are going through this filter and they're coming out a little wonky on the other side. So there's, um, there's like anemia. So there's blood, red blood cell related um, immediate effects. Um, but most patients actually walk out of Thomas Jefferson or Southampton in the UK um, the next day. So you can usually tolerate it and go home. Um, the melphalan, if there's residual melphalan in your blood, then you will see those same effects, anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, you will see that 14 days later, which is the effect of the drug. Now there could be a lot of other things as well. Um, it is a surgery, but there's nothing, there's no other real trends that we have seen. Yes? It's not from for insurance, you said? Well, right now in the U.S. it's only a study, right? So you have to, if you want to have it in the U.S., um, it's through the clinical trial. Which is a cost to the patient or no cost? It's a clinical trial, there's no cost to the patient. Were, were there any other um, drugs tested with your device other than the milk blend? That's a great question. I haven't gotten that question yet. Yes, there was. <laughs> um, and actually, um, none of them were as um, efficacious for liver. So again, this is um, hepato-friendly drug. So. Uh, to a certain extent, I mean, don't get me wrong, it is chemotherapy, right? But um, it is hepato-friendly, was more. So we tried Dicarbazine, we tried a few other ones, and um, this one was the one that definitely came through. So is the six limitation for a lifetime, or is that over a certain This period? is for the clinical trial, to be able to prove our hypothesis. And so once we get approved, um, the label, will say that um, probably that you can have, you know, six in the, every six weeks to start. Um, it won't limit the number you can have, I don't think, at least. I don't know, we'll have to, we'll have to those are discussions we have to have with the FDA. And that really depends if all the patients that have had six treatments have done really well, and they're well enough, they would have been well enough to get more, maybe that's a discussion that we'll have with the regulators to see.
see how they're going to. Um, discussing the negotiations to get a regulatory label are painstaking and uh, very long. They often take several months of sending the text back and forth between the FDA and the pharmaceutical company to actually get that right language. So, um, okay, eligibility. So because we removed the randomization and we need a start point to be able to see when your disease starts growing. In the other trial, in the other amendment, we started when you were randomized. So we said, at randomization, your disease is this size. Well, we need another, the same point, to be able to compare all the patients together. So we turned, um, we replaced the word randomization with eligibility. So your, the sites, they actually have to send us in this form and to say, at this date, this is when, this is day zero, for counting whether your cancer grows or shrinks. And um, so this is taken from our, um, in Europe we do have an advertising campaign called um, Against the Odds. And this is one of the pictures, but it really, we are really very, very interested in the quality of life. So when somebody comes on the trial, we give them a consent at baseline, what we call, to see can you do your normal activities? Can you go play golf? Can you walk outside? Can you, when do you get tired? How many hours of, how many hours do you sleep at night? And things like that. And then after certain periodic treatments, we then look again, like how's the treatment affecting how you came on, what you were like when you came on the study. So ours is called the FHS18. The one we chose, but um, there's a lot of different quality of lives out there, and um, it actually, um, this is just I was I was giving this talk to the the investigators who do our study. So you know, it's really important for us that the patients who do this answer all the questions. <coughs> sorry, answer the questions by yourself without the help of the site and that um, we, uh, we get the questionnaires back. So, nearing the end. Um, end of treatment, follow up, and end of study. So the end of treatment, as I said, is gonna be, it could be three things. It could be that either you or your physician have decided the trial is no longer good for you, and you would have an end of treatment visit. It could be that you finished the six cycles, you would have an end of treatment visit. Or it could be that your disease progressed during the treatment and then you would have an end of treatment visit. And we do that because we want to make sure that if this isn't working, you have an opportunity to have another treatment. So you can discuss with your physician and you're not locked into this. We will still keep on following you. So the follow-up, even if you go on to another treatment, it's very important for us to know how you're doing. Because maybe, you went on to Dr. Patel's trial, and the combination of our treatment plus her treatment actually gave something really good, right? So it's very important for us because right now we don't have, we don't know the sequence. It's very, um, as you know, Dr. Sato said, there isn't many treatments that are approved. So it's important for for all the companies that are working on to the, in this to understand what the sequence is. Can we you know, get the primary tumor in enough time so that you don't have liver metastases, right? How do we understand when do we get liver metastases? If we do get liver metastases, what is the order of things we have to do? Do we do like chemoembolization or immunoembolization first, and then we do the Delcath treatments, and then we do you know, maybe immunotherapy. So that's what we're all working towards, is to get that sequence to actually being able to get the key to the cure, right? And it's gonna be a sequence of events that's gonna lead up to that. Okay, so these are our US sites. And um, we, um, we've had to close some sites because there was difficulties in them getting a team and 
you know, staff turnover of some anesthesiologists leaving and so forth. But these are the, the sites that we have that are doing the treatment right now. And then in Europe, we also have a bunch of sites that are doing the study. So that was the end. So on behalf of the staffs we work with, the sites we work with, the doctors we work with, and my staff at Delca, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it.